absolutely loved it. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. I want to welcome all of our online family and team to those who are watching us through the week on YouTube. We've just had a fantastic morning in worship. Uh, so sorry you couldn't be here. I know there's a whole bunch of reasons why that's the case. Uh, and honestly, we continue to pray for you, Gary, Phil, Jen, uh, and I know that you've had a heck of a week and you've got a week coming up too for, for all three of you. So um, we're believing with you, standing with you, loving on you. Can we say amen? amen. Oh, you might not know who they are, but we certainly do and God certainly does. So um, I, I don't believe... I don't believe in a transactional God. I don't believe in a God that gives something and wants something back in return. Or if we come and bring him our worship, all of a sudden he's going to go, yeah, okay, fair enough, you're worshipped well, you're nailed, okay. I believe in a God that wants to, to do a transaction with us. I believe in a God that wants to transform us. And it doesn't matter what you bring into his presence. So long as you come into his presence, he is going to transform you. Do you believe that? He wants to renew your mind. He wants to refresh your heart. He wants to, re he wants to restore the vision and the purpose for which you were born into. And it's transformational, not transactional. He's not interested in you do good and I'll give you good. You do bad and I'll just pause and think for a second. He gives us grace upon grace. Can I have an Amen. And so into that space, we step and believing that we've got a God who through us wants to turn the world upside down. He wants to turn the world upside down. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I, um, I'm not going to try and get you to say amen all morning. I'd really like you to. I'll kind of just throw that out there. It's like, I'd really like you to engage with me. I'd really like you to say, that's awesome. That was a great point. Oh, wow. I'd like you to do all those sorts of things. Like, that was awesome. That was incredible. Preach it. I'd like to do all those sort of things. But it doesn't look like I'm going to get it. So, we've been here before. No, no. All right, so, uh, we are, we're in our last sort of uh, part of a series where we're talking about stewardship. If we go to this next slide, you'll actually see that we're, we're beginning a journey as a community of faith. As a, as a family where we want to engage in what we call spiritual formation. And it's actually the practices of spiritual formation. It's not, the, it's not the, an intellectual exercise. It's intended to move our Sundays to our Mondays. It's intended to move from our head to our heart to our hands. It's intended to impact every single area of our life, from our marriage to our money to our mates. Come on. And so this, this formation being formed like Christ is our goal. We've got a whole series of things that we believe that we're going to continue to work through as a family and we're going to work through them deliberately. We're going to work through them slowly. We're going to work, work through them intentionally because we want these areas and elements of our life to become more and more like Christ. Less and less like the world. John 3.30 says, I must decrease in order that he may increase. And that's ultimately what we want. I don't want you looking like me, dressing like me, talking like me, any more than I want to do the same for you. But we want to live and smell and react and respond and believe like Jesus, like the author and the perfecter of faith itself. And so we've got all these things. There is actually a, there's a goal that we have with this, and it is actually that we grow in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus was so desperately so passionately wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you more than he wants duty and observance of religious ritual. Okay, we've got ritual actually up there as part of our understanding of how we actually use rituals. Baptism, communion, marriage, um, you know, uh, all those sorts of things. How we actually use those for relationship. And we do it from a relationship with Jesus for a relationship with Jesus. We do it in relationship with each other. And who knows, that means there's going to be some bumps along the way. There's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some, you know, we're going to be planing out the timber. We're going to hit some knots. We're going to get some splinters along the way. That's okay. If we're doing it in relationally motivated, relationally motivated, we're going to be okay. We want to be transformed. We'll kind of covered that a little bit. And we want God to get the glory. So when we talk about spiritual formation, we, one of the things that is key is evangelism and story. So how can the whole world know what you are aware of and that God is good, God is love, and that he has got a plan and a purpose 
for each and every one of our lives. That his goal is not to get you out of the storm, but to stand with you in the storm and actually be so present in you and to you that you can sing in that place. And not be determined by the waves which want to knock us around, but actually be able to stand in a place that says, even if, as Romans 28 says, even if you leave me like a lamb to a slaughter, I will know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not a tax bill, not a doctor's report, not something on the news, nothing. And that's his goal. Amen. So we have this sense of being formed and we want this truth to be told to the world through our story. So before we kick into that, we've chosen to do sort of two parts to this and we've actually chosen to look at how are we stewarding our lives? How are our lives resembling that of Christ? Or how are our lives actually ones of strength when it comes to relationships, when it comes to money, when it comes to our time, when it comes to how we come into gathering? And we want to be able to bring these things and actually challenge you. To how are you sowing? How are you stewarding those components of your life so that when we skip off into the world to tell everyone that Jesus loves them, we actually have a life of some authenticity and some strength that actually backs that up. And that requires some intentionality. Stewardship is intentional. Stewardship is taking care of, intentionally organising, being interested enough to be invested in. That was quite good. I thought, I, I, Miriam Webster didn't write that. I wrote that. I thought that was pretty good. It's interested enough to be invested in. I'm interested enough in my family to invest in them, in my world, in my community, with the time that I have, with the money that I have, with the gifts that I have. I'm interested enough, not, oh, I don't really care. Oh, well, unlucky. Another one bites the dust, I guess, as Queen's saying, you know. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, it's not really my fault. It's not really my problem. What am I, Brian Brothers Keeper? Yes, you are. And we actually have a role and a mission to play on planet Earth. Awesome. That when we have been saved, we can actually be spent. That the reason why we actually want spiritual formation and what starts inside of us is that it can be worked out outside of us. So we're talking about stewardship of our, of our spiritual formation. Now, our formation... It has a foundation. Our formation has the foundation of the fact that you were created on purpose, with purpose, in love. And go and do a Bible search. If you don't know how to do a Bible search, I gladly show you in a, in a paper Bible or in, a, in a, some online portals to actually how to go and look at the renderings and the complexity and the depth of what love really is. What love really means. Not this, I love lasagna type stuff. Oh, I love my new car. You know, know what love really means when it's actually echoing from heaven to earth and intended to bounce back up again. Right. We are created in love. Well, then we broke it. Our self-determining attitudes and our self-righteousness and you can't tell me what to do. It was all part of love. Love gives us choice. And we broke that relationship yeah. in desiring what we desire and determining what we would determine and turning our back on holiness and purity and walking away. And God goes, I love you and I will stand here all day long with my arms stretched wide. And so if the foundation is that you were created, we broke it. And then because he stood there with his arms stretched so wide, it actually, it actually he went to the cross. Awesome. And he died on the cross for us, that we would be reconciled. He would actually say, no, I have reconciled the ledger. All of the stuff that you've ever done wrong and all the stuff you're still yet to do. I think it's probably even a longer list for me. For me. And I, yep, I've signed all off that and I've still, I've still got a mountain to climb for Matt. But I will climb that mountain and I will carry that cross and I will bleed that blood. Amen. Bleed that blood? Anyway. Because he wanted to reconcile himself with us. He wanted to say, come home, I'm not angry. I have paid your debt. This Our formation has this foundation. You were created, you broke it. He's reconciled himself with you. Balanced. And then he actually wants to restore you. He wants to restore you and this is where we're at today through faith. Through faith, beloved. Without faith, it is impossible to believe God, Hebrews tells us. John tells us, what is the works of those of God? It is to believe. It is to have faith in Him. Not turn up to church. All right, we love turning up to church. I believe this is an essential component of formation, community, practice, being challenged, being shaped. Believe you me, I'm going to take a hammer and chisel to you today. 
Okay, so we are going to be shaped in community today. We get to take this stuff and roll it around and go, gee, that was a bit hard this morning. And you go, yeah, but this is what I thought. This is how I saw it. And, this is, and I stood over here and heard it from this perspective. Or actually, that meant a lot to me from that. We do it in community. Hello. We get to be restored in this faith. And our focus is that others may be set free. You know, we, we want to steward this life. We want to be intentionally interested enough to invest in. Matthew 7 talks about the, 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 Jesus is telling a story about wise and foolish builders. I'm sharing it with some friends last week. There's wise and foolish builders that a, a man built his house, he built it on sand, it was quick, it was easy, it didn't, it didn't require digging foundations or putting in reinforcement or, or taking the time to make sure things were, were leveled off and, and, actually, and actually going through the process of establishing a firm foundation, which if you want to build a house quickly, the foundations just suck. Anyone who's ever built a house has walked around that plot of land in the mud and in the reinforcement and they're trying to figure out where the bedroom is and the kitchen is and all you can see is a mess and you just go, can we just get on with it? Can we just get on with it? Yeah. And it's so easy just to build a life on the sand. And Jesus said, this is what a foolish person looks like. A, a person who refuses to steward their life looks like. They want to build their house quick, get it up, get some friends over, let's have a party. But the storms came, the winds blew, the rain beat down. And in that crisis, in that stress and strain, which is pretty common to the planet, his house fell like a crash and everything was lost. He says, a wise person, and be like this, wise person took the time, was diligent, was a steward, was invested, paid the price with the blisters to hone that piece of rock down in order that what built was when the same storm came, when the same rain belted in, when the same wind threatened to rip the roof off, that his house was grounded and he was steadfast and him and everything in it was not lost. You can stand there and go, Father, how was that storm last night? How was that storm? How did you guys go? Oh, we're terrible. Knocked around and bashed around and we lost half our stuff. Gee, how's, how was that last lot of Interest rate hikes. Oh, shocking. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. We're so, we're, we're, we, are, we are lost. We're at wit's end. Houses built on sand. Suppose the houses built on faith. The things of story, same storm. Same storm. Houses built on faith. Oh, what about that last political report? What about that last social media campaign against something perverted and perverse? What about all that? Oh, no, no, no. I've, I've, my, my, my faith, my life, my family right. is grounded. I've, I've spent time. I've been intentional. I've been a steward. Enabling that when those storms come, political strife, referendums, and, and all sorts of horrible things that we, we have to walk through, some of us collectively, some of us individually, yeah. that we're not blown away. Isn't that what we want to take out into our world? Isn't that what we want to say to our neighbour? Oh, what do you? What, how's that storm last night? How's all that financial crisis? How's that war? How's that earthquake? How's that? How's those last lot of politicians who have just gone and done dumb things? How's that last church crash and 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 past a moral fall? Oh, what are you going to do about that? I don't have a faith in a pastor. I don't have a faith in a church. I got a faith in Jesus, and I'm not confusing either or. I don't mistake a gathering to be God. This is a gathering. This is not God. He's God. That's who I set my sights on. Are you all doing okay? Flood and fury and foundations. How are we stewarding this? Psalm 1 in 26 verse 6 says, Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Those who go out with their seed bag, and it's a picture that most farmers would carry over their seed from last season. They'd take the best of it. And what they wanted to eat, they decided to plant. What they decided could actually be good for me. This is the best for me. This would be great for me. No, I, I understand because I'm stewarding that. That if I take that, and even though it hurts, I sow it. I put it into the ground. I trust that God who is the God of seed 
time and harvest. We'll take that gift, that time, that talent. We'll take that, uh, that, that gathering moment where I got up early and attended prayer meeting or I stayed up a bit later and attended prayer meeting or I, was, I went back and went through my finances and said, am I, am I being fed income here? Am I honestly just tipping God and expecting some sort of miraculous return? Oh, I'm taking my seed and I'm going, even this though, this costs me something. I'm going to sow it. I'm going to come back carrying sheaves. I'm going to come back, I'm going to go out carrying seed, but I come back carrying sheaves 10 times, 100 times even more. Yeah. See, 2 Timothy says this. 2 Timothy says, For God did not give us, how we, oh, thank you, Pete. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving, of cringing, of fawning fear. This is not what came from him. This is, not his, this is not his posture towards us. It's not his posture towards planet Earth right now. He's not freaking out. He's actually saying, no, no, I have given you a spirit of power, of love, of a calm and well-balanced mind, discipline and self-control. I've said this a number of times. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I've overcome my fear of flying. I get to fly enough these days, but... Um, I overcame my fear of flying. Basically, I was just too tired to be scared anymore. I was exhausted on the way back from a missions trip. Might have been with you, Pip, coming back from Nepal. I was just, I was just shot, and I, the spirit of fear tried to come and go, ning, 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 ning. And I just went, I just, would you shut up? And went to sleep because I, just, I was just too tired. Right? It was actually quite an interesting interaction. But, but every time I've, I've sort of thought about my my fear of flying, it's actually not that I'm going to die in a plane crash. It's just that I'm going to lose my mind on the way down. That I'm going to go down screaming and just like being that person, ah, you know, making a mess of myself and freaking out everybody around me. That's what I don't want. I want a calm and well-balanced mind. I don't care about death. I just don't want to shame myself on the way down. What about with our, what about with our, our relationships? I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter if, if the relationship is going to stay what it was. Just sometimes I don't, I don't lose my mind in the midst of it. I want to call today's message, I've got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. I've got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. Turn to the person next to you and say, I've got a mustard seed. Turn to the person on the other side and say, oh, I'm not afraid to use it. I've got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. I've got a song. I'm not afraid to sing it. I've got a story. I'm not afraid to tell it. I've got a gift and I'm not afraid to use it. I've got some resource. I'm not afraid to sow it. I've got a mustard seed. I'm not afraid to use it. As we steward our lives, as we talk about this wise and foolish builder, as we talk about this Timothy, I might have this spirit of timidity, fear. I'm not cowering and cringing in the corner because of the circumstances of the world, because someone's accused the church of something. Somebody said something about faith or Christianity or Pentecostalism or, or marriage or men or women. I'm not going, oh, Hang on a second, I, I need to be scared of that. I need to be perturbed by that. I need to, I need to shrink back from that. Yeah. Now I've got a mustard seed of faith. And we're going to unpack this. i a mustard seed. I'm not afraid to use it. I want to, uh, I want to roll through really briefly uh, Matthew 16. We're going to land in Matthew 17 in just a sec, Pete. But Matthew 16, and you, you've got to read. You've got to read like sort of larger series of the Bible. I don't mind just pulling out individual verses, but sometimes you've got to read some of the stuff that Jesus says within the context. What his weeks been like? What the months been like? He's building layer upon layer, right? So Matthew 16. That's Matthew 17. We'll get there in a sec. Matthew 16 is 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 interesting because Jesus is saying all these crazy things. He's saying, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And, uh, and Peter's going, no, you're not. No way. Not on my watch. And Peter gets rebuked. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're, I'm not listening to you at all. Yeah. Jesus goes on to say, you know what? You're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. This is a tough day at the office for the disciples. But Jesus, Peter's had the revelation. You're the Messiah. Jesus has gone five gold stars for you, Pete. Excellent. And then he's just been slapped in front of everybody 
for his pride and his ego and not actually knowing what this whole story is about. Jesus was the only one ever born in order to die. He needed to die in order for you to be free. We get to rejoice in that fact. And Peter's going, no, no, no. I'm going, I, I, I probably would have been with Peter. I'm an egotistical just blowhard, right? So I would have been with Peter. But it was actually that sense of saying, no, no, no. Now as I stand here, I go, thank you, Jesus. Go to the cross. I need you to go to the cross. I'm lost without you at the cross. Peter's been rebuked. They've told that they're going to pick up their cross. This is a rough day in Matthew 16. Matthew 17. Let me, let me read it. I've got, a, I've got a paper Bible. You probably haven't even seen me read a paper Bible here before. It actually exists. I actually, this is my favorite. So let's start in Matthew 17 before we get to those other, those other verses there, right? After six days, I, I love the fact that Jesus has just given Peter a slap. He's just told all of us how we're going to live our lives, that he's taking up our cross and following him. And then he gives us a week off. He says, listen, just let that marinate for a bit. Just, just chill. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Okay, So this following Christ, this stewardship, this if we want to have something to say, something to share, something to sing, it is going to cost you something. Up high mountains by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Just then appeared before them. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, this has been awesome. It's just thanks for bringing us. I wish if you want, we can put up three shelters. We can set up camp here. One for you, Moses and Elijah. And while he was still speaking, God's had a gut for him. He says, I, this is my son. Him I love with him and I am well pleased. Listen to him. Stop talking, Peter. Stop trying to do all this stuff, Pete. Just listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. They were coming down the mountain. Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So this whole concept of a personal and private faith doesn't line up in that verse. Now, you've got a private faith, but it's never intended to just be locked up personally. He was telling his disciples, after I'm gone, then let fly. All right, so you've got the story so far. Yeah. Peter, James, and John have just had this awesome church service. It's been, it's been the best church service ever recorded, all right? Jesus is there. Moses is rocked up. Elijah's rocked up. That's a pretty healthy conference guest list, right? Awesome. Uh, and there's been this light and Jesus has been transfigured and they've been slain in the spirit. And then all of a sudden they're still alone with Jesus again, always a bonus. And they've come back down the mountain and we come back into that verse. Thanks, Pete. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. What we might do, Pete, is there, there's three slides for this one, is there? All right, so if I read the whole thing through, then we might track back and we'll work through them a little bit by a little bit. Thanks. So when they came to a crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. Poof. How long will I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Be really interesting to pick up tones of voice. When we, when we get to replay that, and I wonder how, it, how the tone of voice. I'm so glad it's not in capital letters. If God had texted it, what ones would have been in capitals? Yeah. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. And the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If we can go back to that first slide for me, Pete. I want to sort of just break this down a little bit. You know what? We can have the best church services ever. We can have these rocking times. You can, have, you can go into connect groups or join a prayer meeting and just have this, this moment where I just get to see Jesus in a whole new way and he looks into me in a whole new way and it's wonderful and it's beautiful and yes, we want to set up our tents there and never leave. 
But God is actually saying, no, no, no. You need to come back down the mountain because that's where my light and my love is needed. This is your mission and your mandate. Jesus himself didn't even want to stay on that mountain, transferring in all of his glory and all it was worth and all he was worthy of. He, he stripped himself again of his deity and stepped down into the dirt and the dust and the disease of our daily lives. Are we able, are we willing to steward what God has given us and take it from our Sundays and into our Mondays? Are we willing to get off our mountains and come down into the valleys where the pain is, where the suffering is? We can sit at banquet tables while people in the streets starve. We can have this opulence which considered to the majority world who exist on what, $2 a day. I'm not going to start my missions yet. But this is a missions verse. When they came down off the mountain... What good is our faith if it doesn't have works, James asks us. What are we doing? Just singing and worshipping to God and, and just reveling in the, in the wonder and the beauty of it if it changes nothing. Wow. Jesus could have worshipped himself. He came to save that which was lost. And those who have been saved, those who have been found, those who have been set apart, we have a purpose. Right. And it's to turn the world upside down of depression, of anxiety, of despair, of divorce, yeah. of debauchery, of licentious and lost living, of living without boundary and without purpose and without revelation. Right. We have a mission. And this will be our mission, and we'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But we need to go where the pain and where the strain is, where the truth, the light, the love, the power is. Last week we spoke about the promise for us is inside of us. The promise of God's provision to make sure that we have been fed. Matthew 6 tells us, don't worry about what you wear or what you eat. The sparrows of the field don't and the flowers of the field, they actually they are dressed more beautifully than Solomon ever could. Don't worry about this life. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his righteousness. Seek, seek first relationship with him and everything else you're going to have is going to be added to you. You don't need to worry about these things. The promise for us is inside of us. God will provide for his children. The Bible tells us I've never seen a generous man and his family begging for bread. I'm not, I'm not just turning a blind eye to interest rates. I live in your world. You live in mine. I get it that car registrations and insurances are going through the roof. It's ridiculous. But I've never seen a generous person, a faithful person, a person who gives with joy, a, a person who gives out of worship, not out of giving to, in order to get something back. I remember my first offer of $50. I checked the mailbox every day for a week, expecting to get 500 bucks back. <laughs> Swear to God. We ended up getting so much more than that over our lives, and not just in checks and cash. Right. In you, right. in my friends in family, who helped Karen and I carry the load, who have lifted up these weak and feeble arms in dark days. We've got you, we've got our children, we've got our health, we've got a land that we live in that doesn't have tanks in it. And people aren't kicking down our doors and storming into our church services. We're blessed, blessed, blessed. This provision that he has for us, this guidance that he has for us, this authority that he has for us, it's been placed inside of us already. And then we've got to come down off our mountains. We've got to come into the crowd of places and be ready for the questions to come. Jeepers, I'm spinning an awful lot this morning. I don't, I'm going to need a drink. I'm going to be dehydrated. Someone get an intravenous in here. That's why the rows keep getting pushed back. All the people online, you have no idea. You can't see the front row. They're all wearing ponchos. It's like, a, like the MCG in the winter here. My Lord, what is going on? I can see your faces going. That was, that was a big one. All right. When they came down to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. In our times of need, do we kneel or do we whine? And you can write whine any way you want. You can write whine, W-H-I-N-E, or you can write whine. I don't know. Do, we, do you whine or do you kneel? 
This is a man who is in great distress. His son, his child, his life is suffering. And he has positioned himself before Jesus. We, we're about to find out that he's disappointed. And yet he still came to Jesus. We have got a generation who have grown up in the church and who are sitting in church services this morning and are whining that Jesus hasn't given me what I want and it's so unfair and if only you knew and can't you see what I've done, etc., etc., etc. And they actually won't worship in the waiting. They whine in the waiting. I know that's not you. But I know it's not me. I've been sick this week. Right, Karen probably should have called an ambulance a couple of times. I had the man flu. I don't know why she didn't do that. I, you know, I needed to go, I see you. I've been, it's, been, it's been death. It's been horrible. Yeah. And the whining. Amen. The whining. The why, man. Oh, this is so unfair. And can't you see I've got a job to do? Jesus is gone. I'm pretty sure I know all about you, Matt. <laughs> when they came to the crowd, a man approached them and he knelt down. The kneeling or the feeling. Your choice. We have deified our feelings in this day and age. And we are the laughing stock of the majority of the world who doesn't get to get up and go to work seven days a week with their 10 year olds. And it's all about feelings. They get to work and then they worship. And the churches which are being planted throughout the Middle East and throughout the subcontinent and throughout Africa are being planted and they are being in services and they are not worried about their feelings. They, all they know is that God has saved me and all I need to do is kneel and he will supply my need. We have got to understand when we come back down off the mountain, do you know who's waiting for you? Need. And so ready to kick the stuffing out of you and trying to get you to deny that last experience that you just had based on the circumstances that you face. Wow. Trying to get you to deny the last experience that you had, that last worship that you had. Oh, I jumped up and down in church. I raised my hands for the first time. I drive out the driveway and I just lose my mind because what's waiting at the bottom of the, of the mountain? Yeah. Satan ready with a black bag and a baseball bat. And yet he has not given us that spirit of fear. And do we choose to kneel then? Or do we whine then? When they came to the crowd, what are we stewarding in this? This is all about stewarding, right? It's all about stewarding. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So what do I do? Where do I go? What am I supposed to do? Where, I can, I, what do I what do? I, what do I do when I'm faced with this sort of this upheaval in my life? This upheaval with finances or relationships or my health. What do I do when my, when my life is just churned around? Well, I know what he did. He ran to Jesus and he knelt before him. What do we do? What do we do? This effects of disease, it's deplorable pain. And confusion. But it drives believers away from Jesus, not to him. What's with that? What's with that? That's why we need community to practice this. That's why we need small groups. That's why we need our prayer gatherings. That's why we need the church. So that people can go, hey, come on, Buster. Come on, hey, hey, hey. Buster, there's a word. Come on, Buster. Come on, mate. This is not whose image you are made in. This is not the song that God desires you to sing. We will stand with you. We will believe with you. In the areas that you can't, we believe that God will and we will pool our resources to get you through this time. But we've got to run to Jesus together. I love this question. What are you, what are you willing to do? What, what would this guy be willing to do in order that my son might be set free? I've asked this question of lots of people facing some really dire circumstances in my life. What, what, what are you willing to do? Anything, 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 anything. I'll do anything, anything. I'll do anything. I right, see you on Sunday. Oh, hang on. I'm sitting. Oh, no, I, um, I might be busy this Sunday. You, you just told me you were willing to do anything. What if we pray together? Oh, no, I can't pray. I don't really, you know, I don't really pray. You just told me you were willing to do anything. I've got this, this illness. I've got this sickness. Well, what if we worship together? Oh, I can't worship. You just told me you were willing to do anything. 
What does this man do? He's willing to do anything. Will you kneel? Will you give? Will you serve? Will you bake a cake? One of my favourite stories comes from a, uh, from a, I can't actually remember his name now, Matthew, Matthew Barnett. There you go, thank you, Lord. Matthew Barnett runs the, runs the Dream Center in Los Angeles, 24-hour church. You know Matthew Barnett? Mega, mega church. But his ministry is so simple. He's got, he's got people who come to him and he goes, this woman comes to him just massively depressed and I just have no purpose in my life. I don't know what to do. And I've, I've got all the medications and my, my husband has left me and my children don't want to be with me. And I just, I just, you know, I just, there's nothing going on. He goes, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to go and bake a cake for the lady across the road and then come back and see me. And she, and she was filthy at him. You mean to tell me you got this mega church 24 hours a day on TBN and blah, 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 blah. And you're telling me in all of my pain, Go and make a cake for somebody. He said, yeah. Come back and see me in a week. She didn't come back and see him for a month. He thought, oh, gee, was she, maybe I really did offend her. She came back and saw him for a month and said, I'm so sorry, Pastor Matthew. I haven't been able to, to come back, but I've been too busy making cakes for everybody. I was so angry that you told me to go and make a cake for my next night. But I thought I'll do it anyway. So I went and did it and I felt so much better. It's unbelievable. The look on her face, she wasn't expecting it. I love cooking anyway. So it was actually a bit of a joy. It gave me something to do with my hands. And so I, I went and started baking cakes for everybody in the neighborhood. I feel great. Off the medication, here we go. Now, I'm not wanting to oversimplify your circumstance. But I am asking, what are you willing to do? Wow. Naaman, who was covered in leprosy, went to see a prophet. The prophet said, go and wash yourself in the River Jordan seven times. He goes, the River Jordan is a sewer. Why would I have come all this way to get that word? And yet he went and did it anyway, and he was healed. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to steward? I've got to get my skates on. Are you doing okay out there? He said, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. We're going to get to this in a second. But I brought this to your disciples, and they could not heal him. What, what would we normally do in that position as believers, as disciples of God? We'd be going... Well, I'd be slinking away in the corner and I'd be going, yeah, don't talk to me, Jesus, because I'd be so ashamed and so embarrassed. What do the disciples do? What do disciples do? They stand their ground and they make themselves teachable. They make themselves prunable because they're going, I am so interested in what you're doing in my life. I'm going to be invested even if it hurts. Doesn't cower. They don't reduce their theology. They simply stay and in line. They keep turning up. Jesus moves on. One of the toughest verses to try and unpack. I'm going to try and do it really simply. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? This is not the kindest thing. There is lots of debate by scholars and theologians and all these people about who Jesus was actually talking to. Was he talking to the disciples or was he talking to the crowd? Matt's understanding of it is, I don't care. Talk to whoever it fits. Is it you? Then wear it. If it's not, then walk on and keep laying hands on people and keep pushing forward. If this is us... I don't care. Oh, no, well, he wasn't talking to the disciples. He wasn't talking to believers. I'm backing out of this one. It's all on you, world. Or is it actually, oh, it's all on me. And oh, no, and I'm going to have to. Be, oh, Jesus doesn't like me anymore. I'll do anything, but just don't talk to me like that, Jesus. I like, I, like the, I, like the, I like the cuddly Jesus. I like, the, I like the warm Jesus. I like the Jesus with children sitting on his lap and he's handing out fish sandwiches. I like that Jesus. That's, make me that Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make me a Jesus that looked like that. And he's going to do everything that he wants me to do whenever he wants me to do it. And it's all going to be so easy. Yeah. As opposed to the Jesus who goes, Oi, I've given you authority to drive out evil spirits. I gave it to you back in Matthew 10. I've sent you out. You've done it already. What are you doing, guys? What are you doing, church? Are we willing to wear this? Are we willing to take ownership for this? And if you don't like it, I don't care because there's little boys throwing themselves into fires. I don't care because there's marriages breaking up. I don't care because there's people who are committing suicide. I don't care because there's people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol and beating their families up. So whether or not it hurts your feelings or not, I don't really care. 
We'll be friends. We'll share a cup of coffee afterwards. It'll all be okay. You unbelieving and perverse generation, all you want is me to just say sweet things to you and whisper in your ear and give you a little cuddle. And Jesus is going, no, there is a world that is perishing. We came down off the mountain for people like this. So who are you? You've forgotten who you are. This unbelieving and perverse, I could probably spend the next half an hour trying to unpack it and make you feel better about yourself. But why would we do that? Let's just wear it. Let's wear it as believers. They should lay hands upon the sick and they will be made well. They should actually invite people into situations where they can encounter the presence of God. They should actually live a life that shines so that let our good works shine before all men that they may know him and give him glory. Amen? Amen. Give me five more minutes. I see you sneaking up there. <laughs> why, was, why was Jesus ticked with them? Because they're actually saying, because you, you've got faith in me, but not the me in you. It's, it's JC, not me. No, that's not what he says. He said, I've already given you authority. I, I'm, I'm glad that you waited until I came back down. I know that you had faith in me, but I put my faith in you. I put my, I know I've got the power, but I put my power in you. I know that I carry a supernatural presence and maybe there's so many things that only God can do, but he wants to do it through you. And we need to take up a believing position. I don't care if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Keep laying hands upon the sick. That's what he said, lay hands upon the sick. How many people have we laid hands on at work? in our family that is ill and suffering and sick. And we just go, listen, I'm, I'm, I don't need to freak you out. I don't mean to freak you out, but honestly, I've got a faith in a God who heals. I've got stories about him healing. Some of them are mine and there's millions over the earth. Can, can I, you're suffering here. Would, would you be willing to, can I pray for you? Yes, great. Lord God, you know my brother, you know my sister. Would you just bless them and heal them and set them free? And I just speak your love towards them, your power over them, you know, meet their need in every way possible. Jesus, because you're so good and you love this person. Amen. I know that some of you work in environments where that's not always possible, so take them to a coffee shop. Text them. Call them. Have them over for dinner. Do something. Steward that mustard seed because people are perishing. People are in pain. They're in agony. You know I've quoted this a whole bunch of times. One of the plagues that came upon Egypt, the 10 plagues, was the plague of darkness. And the Egyptians cried out in the darkness because the Bible actually says it was a darkness that they could feel. It was a darkness which sunk not just in their physical bones. They weren't just bumping into furniture. It was a darkness which sunk down into their bones. And this is the world that we live in, beloved. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. No one lights a, a, a lantern, puts it under the table. No one keeps a seed that's supposed to die and produce a hundredfold and, and keeps it in their pocket. Yeah. Who are we? What are we doing? How are we stewarding our life? I love the fact that this guy brought his greatest possession and his greatest pain to Jesus. His son. His son. I'm not trying to play gender roles at the moment. I'm not trying to be gender affirming of guys and girls and bits and pieces. But in the day, this was a tremendous possession for him. This was the one to take on family businesses. This is the one who was going to provide for the family. All those other areas. He brought his greatest possession and his greatest pain. What about you? How are you stewarding that? Can your greatest possession, what is it? Who is it? And are you holding on to it? Or like a seed, are we willing to let it go? Your greatest pain. Are you making that your identity? Are you making that your excuse? Are you making that your reason? Oh, I don't worship. I don't worship until God does this for me. Oh, I'm not worshiping. Till they sing the songs I want and the tempo that I want. Till the temperature is 22.4 degrees with a humidity of 37% and I'm wearing wool. I'm not doing anything. Stewardship. And having been rebuked, having been pretty well chastised, what's the next verse say? 
And the disciples came to Jesus in private. It's been a pretty tough message this morning. What are you going to do with it? You're going to take it to Jesus and say, honestly, Jesus, that was... I'm really, I'm, really, I'm really nervous about giving some more time. I'm really nervous about praying some crazy prayers. I'm really nervous about joining a roster. I'm really nervous about revisiting my finances and honestly, you know, moving into... And again, like we keep coming back to finances and I want to make sure you understand this point because this church does not want your money. This church wants your freedom in your money. Hello? You don't give. It makes no difference to us whatsoever. It makes a heck of a difference to you. A massive difference to you. And that matters to me. God can supply this church with ravens. Okay? He can, he can, he can bring in money from anywhere and everywhere. Doesn't, does not require that from you. And I don't require that from you. But what I desire for you is what God desires for you. Is that you would bring your full tithe into the storehouse. And then in trusting God, he would open up the storehouses of heaven. And he would pour it out upon you. My desire is that this entire church, that the entire church is just full of Porsches. And, and what? And Silverado. Silverados. Amen, brother. <laughs> Why? Because you drive a fancy car? No, because you've, you've just been blessed and you've been blessed and you've been blessed and you've blessed others and you've blessed others and you've blessed others. How will we steward this? Will we go to Jesus? Faith. As small as a mustard seed. You know these mustard seeds? This wasn't, some, this wasn't some mystical seed from far off Africa that no one had ever heard about. This isn't the mythical truffle that's going to be sort of dug up by pigs and it's worth you know, $10 million a pound. This is the everyday common mustard seed. Everybody knew it. Everybody had it. They were all, you know, they were everywhere. The tiniest of tiny seeds. And when Jesus said, if we go to Matthew 13, I think it's there, is it Pete? Jesus name there it is Oy! I love that I love that when it happens Jesus told another parable so he's, he's already told this story right remember we were just telling the story Matthew 17 let's backtrack got to read it in context he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed do you get that oh yeah yeah I know mustard which if a man took and planted in his field though it's the smallest of all seeds yet when it grows it's the largest of plants and becomes a tree so the birds come perch in the branches and that faith comes and we plan it. When that moment arrives for us to share our story or our testimony, and we'll work on this later on. We'll get to this after missions. We'll start leaning in and training how we go about doing this. We will equip you and we'll upskill you and you'll do it in small groups and we'll practice together. And, and I love street preaching and I don't have a problem with people going out in the streets, but that doesn't always have to be everybody's lane, but you need to be ready. Because people need to come and rest in your truth and then they need to be able to carry your own truth. My prayer is this. My prayer is this. Is that this morning in ministry, as soon as we allow God to do what God wants to do in you, as he challenges you this morning. And Father, I just, I just really pray, as I was praying this morning, that this, this challenge hasn't been a man to another person. It's been deep calling out to deep. That it's been you speaking, you uh, making us comfortable enough to, to rise up out of our passivity and our apathy and our fear. Because you did not give us a spirit of fear, well-balanced courage, discipline, a desire for others. I don't want you to hear from me. I don't want you to walk out just going, gee, the flopping preacher slapped us this morning. It'd be a nightmare unchanging, shrug it off, please. But allow those words of God, if he's penetrated your spirit, if he's spoken into your heart that goes, you know what, I am holding something back. You know what, I, maybe I do need to kneel. Maybe, I'm been, maybe I've been clothing myself in my pain or maybe I'm holding back my possessions because I just don't know if God can really, really bless me the way that he's promised me to. So my prayer is this. I was actually read it the last night of Light Up Hobart. It's Philippians 1. And this is my prayer. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. As we read this prayer, and I might get the rest of the team to come. My prayer is that 
as, as I pray this prayer over you, my prayer is that you might actually hold between your thumb and your forefinger. And you can't even hold it up so you can see it. That's how small the mustard seed is. You've got to hold it in faith already. Holding this seed. And you might actually go, you know what? I've got a mustard seed. And I don't want to sit in my seat with it any longer. I want to sow it. Maybe I don't know where. Maybe I don't know how. I just got to trust God with my gift, with my time, with my talent, with a call to gather, with a call to prayer, with a call to speak when He says speak or shush when He says shush. That one would laugh on was just for me. I'm willing to bring that into this space down here. and I'm willing to surrender it under God in faith. So as I pray this prayer, would you just, would you just take that mustard seed between your thumb and your forefinger you can do this with us online as well let me pray this prayer over this seed I'm going to jump off this stage and I'm going to invite you to come into this space and just simply stand with your mustard seed just your faith so I'm giving it to you God this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight you may be able to discern what is best and you may be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus. You may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Amen over your life. As the team sings, why don't you come? Amen.